I think we've all observed this. Uh, perhaps we've, uh, we've or, or learned this truth. M- maybe, maybe sometimes uh, in a very personal way and, and in a way that didn't always go so well. But, you know, when, when we're facing adversity, it, it, it tends, it, it, it can be one of those situations where our, our true colors come out, right? When, you, when the heat is on, when, when you feel compromised, when you feel vulnerable, in life, whatever, in whatever way it may be, when you feel threatened or maybe even attacked, again, our true colors have a way of, of bubbling to the surface. We, we become emotional and we react sometimes without even thinking whether, whether good or bad. And um, so, yeah, we can learn a lot about, about other people. We can learn a lot about ourselves when we're facing adversity, when the heat is on. And, um, and, and those, uh, those moments, those situations in life can be indicators of where, where a person is at, both emotionally and or spiritually. So the folks that Peter was writing his letter to, First Peter, he wrote this letter to some Christian folks who were facing adversity. And the adversity specifically had to do with their connection to Christ, their faith in Jesus Christ as their savior. I look around the room, I, I have a feeling we, we're all pretty familiar with what life, I mean, not firsthand, but we, generally we, we have an idea of what life was like in the first century in this regard, the, the fact that Christianity was not, it was not an official religion, but, but even that aside, it just wasn't widely respected, it wasn't widely accepted. And as a result, there was plenty of persecution. Uh, Christians in the first century they, they dealt with a lot. Not that Christians today don't as well, um, but certainly it was true back then in the first century. Uh, for example, just or Jesus himself, they, I mean, he ended up being crucified for, for being Christ. But even before that, they tried to run him off a cliff. And if you, you can go back and read it in Luke chapter 4, for claiming to be the, the Messiah that the Lord had promised throughout the Old Testament era. Uh, Stephen is a great example. In Acts chapter 7, we read about how Stephen was stoned to death on the spot for sharing his Christian faith, for, for witnessing to the opposition. And then we're told that on that very day, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, the very next verse after Stephen's execution, it says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. That's how it was. There was this constant clear and present danger if you were a Christian in that part of the world in those days. And, and I can't even imagine what that would be like. Just how, how frightening that would be from an earthly standpoint in terms of our, our, our physical well-being, how, how vulnerable you would feel, how, how uncertain your future would seem. And how desperately you'd want that all to go away. Even to the point of, of, of asking yourself that question that I've been posing all morning, which is why? What, what, why? First of all, why is this happening? I mean, you know the why, but, but, but why is this? What, why, why does the connection to Christ have to result in this? And, and then, is it worth it? Why am I, why am I staying in this place, this... It, 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 in, with the status as a Christian known in this world and what the implications of that may be. That there would certainly be a temptation to leave your faith aside for the sake of some peace and safety here on this earth. And the, the Apostle Peter knew that. He knew, he knew his audience. He knew what they were facing. He faced it himself. And, and so he wrote this letter, First Peter, he wrote this letter, this encouraging letter filled with gospel, beautiful gospel truths and promises and assurances to first century persecuted Christians. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start at the end of this lesson where in First Peter 2 verse 10, he writes, once you were not a people, once you had not received mercy, so he reminds them of the reality of, of, of the alternative, Right? There was once a time in their lives, just like you and me, just like every single soul in the history of, we're, we're all born into this world with sinful nature, with, 
without faith in God. There was a time when they, just like you and me, didn't belong to God. And, and he reminds them of the contrast. There was a time when they weren't God's people. There was a time when they didn't have, they weren't recipients of God's mercy, of the forgiveness that Jesus won on the cross. Yes, Jesus lived and died for every single sin, and, and it's there for all people, but without faith, we don't have that forgiveness. So there was a time, Jesus, uh, Peter reminds them, there was a time when they didn't have the assurance of their forgiveness. They hadn't received mercy in that way from God. There was a time when they were living in, in really what, what amounts to a, a helpless, hopeless darkness with regard to spirituality, with regard to faith. But, but again, Peter's making this contrast. He says, once you were not a people, and then he goes on to say, but now you are the people of God. And, and in verse, the previous verse, verse 9, he calls them God's special possession. I know I use the word favorite a lot. How many favorites can you have? But I love that, I love that, that characterization that, that we are God's special possession. In, in life, to, I, I think a lot of us would balk at, a lot of people in the world in general would balk at this idea of being belonging to someone or something else. That, that just doesn't feel right. We are our own people. We're, we're self, um, we, we, we can take care of ourselves, right? This idea of belonging to someone else, it, it just doesn't feel right oftentimes. And sometimes it isn't right. But the reality is, as human beings, we all belong to something or some, someone or something. And, and by that, what I mean is, as human beings, there's always someone or something that has our, our loyalty, there's always someone or something in life that has our attention. There's always someone or something in life to which we are committed. So it's a reality for every single person that we belong to someone, we belong to something, and to belong to God, to be his special, his treasured possession, that is a beautiful, amazing, wonderful thing. You are God's dearly loved child. You were bought at a price, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, Paul writes, you were bought at a price, the price of a life, the price of God himself, God's son, Jesus Christ. You mean that much to him. That word special is one I think we use plenty. Um, it, it's, it's a loaded word here in the context of our relationship with God. You're so special that Jesus gave his life. You were bought at a price. God so loved not only the world collectively, but he so loved each and every one of you on a very individual, personal level. That, that he chose you from eternity. He chose you from before time began. He died on a cross for you before you had faith, before there was, uh, I mean, we never deserve it, right? But even before we had any sort of relationship with God, and he sought you out and he has brought you into his in, in, into, as a member into his eternal family of faith. And again, that is a beautiful, amazing, wonderful status to be God's special possession. But here's the thing, that's not, an always, that's not always an easy place to be in life. The reality is that as Christians, there are crosses that we bear. And I'm not just talking about, I think that, that phrase, I know that phrase is used kind of generally for anyone in life as they're going through something difficult. When, when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, he's talking about things that we endure, difficulties and challenges that we endure specifically because of our relationship with Christ, specifically because we're putting our faith into action over and above anything else in life. And, and as a result, there are crosses to bear. There are, there's adversity. There are challenges that we have to face in life. And challenged Christians, just like the first century uh, Christians, recipients of, of Peter's letter, challenged Christians can become doubting Christians. Perhaps you've had thoughts similar to this when challenged. Um, you might ask yourself, I know I've had thoughts like this, Lord, why? why? Again, there's that question, right? Why, why, Lord, are you letting this happen to me in my life? I mean, I, honestly, you, you say, believe in me and, and put me first, and, and as a result, I'm going through a very, very difficult thing. Why are you letting this happen? Why are you allowing these things? Is this what my faithfulness, my loyalty to you gets me? 
Or, or, or Lord, you said you'd never leave me or forsake me. But I don't, I don't see that right now. I don't feel your presence in my life. Lord, I don't think it's fair that I should have to suffer for doing good. I don't think it's fair, Lord, that I, that I should have to choose between my faith and, and my family or my friends. I, well, I don't think it's fair that I should have to choose between my faith and, and the culture around me that I, that I enjoy and, and embrace and live in. Those are all lies from the devil. Those are all those seeds that, that the devil is trying to plant to rip your soul away from your Savior. Here's, here's the amazing thing. God, by His amazing grace, because of His amazing grace, even within that context, our reaction to adversity, to those crosses, doesn't change who God is. And it doesn't change how He operates in, in, in our lives. Adversity, and, and especially our reaction to it, including, and I'm thinking, our, spirit, our, our sinful reactions to adversity. Don't change, first of all, God's forgiveness. He doesn't say, you know what? You, you've, you've doubted me one too many times. You've, you've looked in other directions for peace and, and security one too many. He doesn't do that. Our, react, our sinful reactions to adversity, it doesn't change his forgiveness. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And that concept of grace is one of undeserved love, his gracious, undeserved forgiveness. Our uh, adversity and our sinful reactions to it don't change his support. 1 Peter 5, verse 10, the God of all grace, Peter writes, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. Adversity, especially our reaction to it, doesn't change God's plans for us. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. This is this forgiveness, this support, this guidance, these plans that God has for our lives. This, this ties in beautifully with the fact that Peter calls Jesus that living stone. A, a stone is an inanimate, emotionless, disengaged thing, but Jesus is a living stone. He, he, he's not this impersonal, inanimate object. He is alive and well and active in our lives. The Apostle Peter also it talks about just illustrates just how, pro, pro, uh, how profoundly impactful Christ is in our lives. He calls him a chosen, in verse 6, a chosen and precious cornerstone. Um, I don't know if we have any structural engineers in the room today, but I, I, I don't feel that a cornerstone really has much structural. Um, it's not a load-bearing thing, right? It, 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 back then, it, it played a more crucial role. It, it was the starting point for construction and then this ongoing point of reference, Today, it's, you, you put the year on it, and it's, it's more uh, decorative than anything. But in, in, in those days, it was a much bigger deal. And so that's, that's the picture that Jesus, that, that Peter is painting here, that Christ is the starting point, and he is the ongoing point of reference in our lives. In a world full of the devil's lies and deception, we have Christ and his word, which is true, which is accurate, which is edifying, which is always for our good. In a world full of changing expectations and broken promises, we have Christ's unchanging truths. That's one of my favorite, um, is that word again, uh, characteristics about what, what are the most unassum one of the more unassuming characteristics of God, that he doesn't change. It means that what he says in his word still applies to us today. We don't have to question. We don't have to wonder. And so again, in a world of, of changing expectations and broken promises, we have his unchanging truths and his unfailing promises. In a world of conditional love and quite honestly, uh, canceling people when, when we find out that we have different opinions on, on a particular topic, we have God's unconditional love. And we have his sacrificial love. In a world of adversity, we have 
the all-powerful creator of the heavens and the earth, who is our strength, who is our support, who is our guide in life. He is that chosen and precious cornerstone in verse 7. Uh, Peter calls him the stone the builders rejected, who has become the capstone. You know, the, 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 the capstone is... Um, it is one of the greatest achievements of Roman civilization, and it's that, that stone at the top of an arch, a wedge-shaped stone, and if you, if, if you were to take that out, the arch fails, the arch collapses, and perhaps even some the, the surrounding walls. Well, that's the picture that, that Jesus is for our life, and that's what, that's, what, that's what Paul is pointing, or Peter is rather, is pointing out. Jesus is that load-bearing capstone in our lives, and, and you remove that capstone in our world falls apart, whether or not a person realizes it. Because without that load-bearing capstone, sin is now unresolved. Guilt has a way of becoming unbearable. Our peace, the peace of God that transcends all understanding, is non-existent. Our stability is lost. Our future becomes uncertain. And adversity has a way of overwhelming us. That's why the Apostle Peter three times in our lesson calls Jesus precious. And I realize if you're like me, you're going to Lord of the Rings right away, right? My precious. Um, you know, it's an actually a good illustration though, isn't it? There was characters in that movie throughout the trilogy that, that saw this precious, this ring as something so precious they couldn't live without. But in the end, it, it wasn't trustworthy. They had to destroy it, right? Well, Jesus is precious. And as it says in verse 6, he, the, the one who trusts in him, will never, ever, ever be put to shame. You are, I love all these characteris characterizations here in this, in this section. We are his chosen people, verse 9. God chose you. It says in, in, in Ephesians 1, verse 4, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy, to be blameless in his sight. We are living stones, the apostle Peter calls us, who have been built into a spiritual house brought to faith by the Holy Spirit, mortared together into this, this spiritual house, this structure, this family of believers to serve and support one another, to let our Christian light shine in a sinful world, and to honor and glorify God in and with our lives. It's in that spirit then, the verse just after our, our text for today, verse 11, Peter writes, Dear friends, I urge you to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. In other words, as, as living stones, as Christ followers, we have the opportunity, we have the privilege to, of, of honoring our Lord in this world, in good times and in bad, in times of peace as well as in times of adversity, so that, as Peter writes in verse 9, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So it's true, adversity has a way of revealing our true colors. It also is an opportunity to, to be Christ-like. It's also an opportunity to be those living stones that, that Peter calls us here who trust instead of doubt. Living stones that are loyal instead of caving in to societal pressures around us. Uh, living stones who give glory to God instead of giving in to the devil's lies and deceptions. Living stones who, who focus on Christ, the living stone, who, as Jesus says, is the way and the truth and the life. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for your Son, our Savior, Jesus, who is the, the living stone in our lives. He is our strength. He is our support. He is our protection. He is our guide. You are these things in our lives. Thank you for being that for us, for this strength and support and protection and guidance and peace and, and hope and joy. These things are found in no other place as they are found in you and through you, ultimately in knowing that we are at peace with you and knowing that our sins have been paid for, paid in full, and that heaven is our home, as Jesus reminds us in John chapter 14, that that you, our Savior Jesus, have prepared a place for us with you in eternal glory where there is no death or mourning or crying or pain. Help us to reflect on these beautiful truths, your, your limitless love and your incomprehensible plans that you have 
for us. Help us to reflect on these things and, and to let them be the motivation in our lives to, 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 to be proud of being connected to you. And to when you give us the opportunity to let our, our Christian light shine so that we may declare the, your praises, the praises of you who have called us out of the darkness of unbelief and into your, your family of faith. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And, 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 and our prayer then today is that we would always have a profound appreciation for that and to proudly let our Christian light shine here in this world. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus as he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.